Yes, yes, God is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but the church, you and I, those who believe in Christ, we are the ones that have been commissioned to, to carry forth his word, Matthew 28. Carry forth the message of the kingdom. And so instead of, instead of you, Jesus looking at you and me and the eye through this passage and, and saying, well, pr just pray for the lost. Jesus is saying, pray earnestly for laborers. Now, do not hear me say, I'm going to say it again, do not hear me say that it's wrong to pray for the lost. I'm not saying that. What I am saying here is that Jesus places an emphasis on praying earnestly for the laborers. And if I'm honest with myself, yes, I pray that passage every once in a while. I don't pray it consistently, and I certainly don't pray it earnestly. But that is the command. And so in a lot of ways, there's this missional uh, strategy that, uh, that, uh, that Jesus is unfolding in this passage. He's looking at you and me and saying, Pray and pray earnestly and pray for laborers because that is my plan A, that you are going to, you, you are, you are going to pray and you're going to partner with me in prayer and, and, and I'm going to hear your prayer because it's my will uh, that, I, that, that people are sent out into the world and that people go out and, and, and share the gospel. Uh, and, and so that's your, that's your first imperative there, the, to, the pray, to pray earnestly and ask God for later. Go, go proclaim the next one. Go proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. What is that proclamation uh, that, is, uh, that, that, that um, Jesus is talking about? Now, I'm beginning to, just so you know, I'm beginning to drop down into chapter 10. And I, I'm not going to read the entirety of chapter 10. I'm going to let you go back and read that on your own. But, but I want you to see ultimately that, that Jesus was the one that was sending out, telling them to go. Uh, go and, and go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, even in the, of, of the passage in Matthew 22 that I referenced earlier, it expands beyond the, uh, the house, of, uh, house of Israel. What we are supposed to go and do, we are supposed to go and we are supposed to proclaim the coming of Christ. I'm not going to belabor that point because the pastor has done a wonderful job of encouraging you and encouraging me to tell the story. And so really what I'm, what I'm, wanting, what I'm wanting to do is, is, is set up uh, this, uh, between tell the story and 111 uh, that you'll see as an emphasis coming uh, beginning next, uh, uh, next, uh, next Sunday. pastor is going to really be challenging us that, that there's one of us who goes out to, to target one person that they may be one to the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and so that is our message. We, we go and we go and we tell the story. We don't just do that, but we go and we give and we serve. Uh, uh, we serve those who are in need. Uh, chapter 10, verse 8, uh, it says, You recede without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, uh, nor sandals, nor staff. For the laborer deserves his food. Ultimately, what Jesus is saying here is that as you meet, as you serve those that are in need, God will also meet your needs. And so there is this element of trust as well. Go and serve those that are in need. We, 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 we see, the, the, how do we know that those are the, the, the ones that are being targeted are those that are in need? Well, the beginning of verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, clean, cleanse the leopards, uh, cast out demons. These, these are people, what, what Jesus is doing right there in that pa uh, passage, he is identifying individuals that have a deep need for him. And then he looks at us and says, go and you serve those that are in need. Proclaim the gospel to them. Don't, don't, expect, don't expect them to take care of you. Expect me, meaning Jesus, to take care of you in this. These are, uh, the, the, these are those imperatives. And, and so as you think about even the mission offering and the International Mission Board and North American Mission Board and uh, GRI, our other partners here within our state, even what you do, be, be sure you realize that even in the mission offering of what we take up, uh, a portion of that funds Broncos parking outreach that we'll do today and have been doing every home game. Uh, and, and so ultimately what we're doing in these, in, in, in these missions emphasis, we're, we're doing what Jesus said to do. We, 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 we are the ones that are sent out. We're going to proclaim the gospel. We're proclaiming the good news of Christ. We're serving those that have a need. 
look again, look out, our, look out over our city and ask yourself the question, Jesus, do I have the same compassion that you have for Denver? It's a question that I, I, th- I think for me, I have to keep in front of me for, for this year. God, will you give me the same eyes of Christ that, that when I see when I see the multitudes, those that are harassed and helpless, separated, those who are in anguish, those who are alienated, allow, allow me to do these very things and start it by praying earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers. God, through his Holy Spirit, is in that business, and he will do it, and it pleases him. And listen, I promise you, he will answer that prayer. Four last things, and I'm going I'm to clip through these pretty quick, and we're going to wrap, wrap up. Uh, it, it, it's really, when you get down into chapter 10, uh, Jesus begins to lay out, uh, beyond these imperatives, just some general applications that we have to understand that we have to realize that as we go out, these things are, are going to happen. Uh, and, and so if there's four further applications from this, what I would share with you, the first one uh, is to embrace suffering. Em- embrace suffering. Uh, verses 24 through 20, 25 uh, it says that a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple uh, to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? All Jesus is saying there is if if they persecuted me, if if, if they will cause me to suffer for the sake of the kingdom, guess what? You are going to suffer as well. Jesus said that the world will hate you. Uh, Jesus said that you will suffer for my name's sake. And I know, listen, this is not me talking. This is Jesus himself talking. And he's just, he's just, uh, in a lot of ways, he's banishing our expectations. Hey, this is what you're going to face. If you follow follow me, if you follow me, you are going to face these, these things, but, but know, know that, hey, I have walked the same road. Ultimately, I doubt, I doubt if any of us in this room will walk away and be crucified on a cross. And, and so know that Jesus, Jesus suffered. Uh, Jesus still followed the will of the Father. Um, and here's, here's the goodness of that. Um, you know, there, there's, yes, Jesus said that we would be persecuted, but I, I go back and when I was reading this passage and thinking about suffering for the name, for the name of, of Jesus, uh, just, there's a passage that uh, I believe God recalled to my mind. It's Philippians 3. Uh, and, 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 and what Paul is saying here, uh, he says, I, I have suffered, Philippians 3, 8 through 11. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And listen to what he, listen to, listen to what he says. Even Think about suffering and embracing suffering here. here here's, what, here's what Paul says. That I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to embrace suffering. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. And other translations share in the fellowship of his sufferings. If we, we I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, I want to know Jesus and I want to walk closely with him every day of my life. But what Paul is saying here, even in this passage in, in Philippians 3, is that I want to know him but I just don't want to know him. I want to know and share in his sufferings. There is this fellowship that comes with Christ that when we suffer for his name, he, 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 he honors that, not for, not for our name's sake, but for his name's sake. And there is this element of this knowledge of Christ that comes. When, when we are suffering for him, we are knowing him. Because guess what? He suffered for us. 
So embrace suffering, but listen, and I love how, how Matthew follows this up, Jesus follows this up. I, I don't know about you, but when you read that passage of embracing suffering, does it make you a little anxious, honestly? It does, it does me, and Jesus knows that. And so three times in verses 26, 28, and 31, he says what? Do not fear, do not fear. Do not fear. In, in, in this portrait, we, we need to hear this over and over and over. Do not fear. Yes, we will, we, we will suffer for his name's sake. But, but the reality is, is that we shouldn't fear because he is with us. Right prior to the, those do not fear passages, Jesus says this, for it is not you who speak. But the spirit of your father speaking through you. That is Emmanuel, God with us. Um, so we have nothing to fear. Uh, yes, when we hear about suffering, when we hear about uh, uh, going forth with and proclaiming God's word, yeah, it may stir some angst in us, but Jesus knows that and he wants us to hear here over and over again, he is with us, he is speaking through us. Do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Uh, uh, third, uh, uh, we, we, we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to skirt suffering, we want to embrace suffering, we, we, we do not want to fear. Uh, the third thing is that we want to love God more. Uh, verse 32, uh, verses 32 through 39, ultimately what, what Jesus is, is communicating to us here is that, uh, that, he, that he wants your love. He wants your love for him to be supreme. You go back to Revelation 3, uh, the sin of the church at Ephesus. They lost their first love. You, you read this, this passage here, and, and, and you see that in, in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 36, a person's enemies will be of those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Those are tough passages to swallow. And what Jesus is saying is, don't, he's, not, he's not saying that you don't love your mother and father. He, he's not saying that you don't love your, your kids. What Jesus is saying is that your love for him will pale in comparison when you look at your love and your earthly relationships. On a world level, it will look like hate. It, when the world sees it, the, the, they, will, they will think that you hate your mother and your father. They will think that you hate your kids. But that's not the case at all. It's that ultimately your love, your love for Jesus is more. <laughs> Last thing, yes, love God more, Fourthly, seek the reward from Jesus. Seek, seek the rewards from Jesus. Verses 40 through 42, uh, th that is ultimately what, what Jesus is saying to, 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 to you and, and to me. Seek the rewards that come from him. Do not seek the rewards that come from this earth. Uh, I, am, I, I am all about uh, goals and New Year's resolutions. Uh, I think they're great. You, you need them, I need them. Uh, I think that it sets, uh, it sets us up in, in aiming for something in this new year. But as I've kind of been doing some personal meditation over the last, the last few days, um, uh, this is the very thing that I have been meditating on. What are, Lord, what are the goals that you have for me? Uh, when I look at this passage in Matthew 9 and this parallel passage in, in, in Luke 10, what, what do you require of me? And, and, and what, what it is in, in, in the end is that we should pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, that, we, that he would send out laborers into his harvest. And, 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 and can I add one thing to that? In the overall context of even the Great Commission, 
in Matthew 28. And even seeing in the context here that right after he says that, he calls the 12 uh, to himself and he sends them out. That, that, I, that I would be, that I would be very cognitive that every time I am at a gas station or a restaurant, every time that I am on a ski lift, and having a conversation, you can have some chat, you can get some chatty people on the ski lift sometimes. It's great. You can carry conversation. Every time I walk into a store, a restaurant, a grocery store, every time I pull onto my street and park my car and I'm surrounded by my neighbors, that that I'm included in those who are sent out. Jesus previously, and, and here, here's a good, if you're, if you're going to set a spiritual New Year's resolution for this year, here's a good one. Running into the context of Matthew 10. This is mine for this year. I don't know, I haven't put some, I hadn't put the measurables to it. I, I don't know how to do that just yet, but here, here, here's my goal. Matthew 6 that I would not lay up treasures for myself on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but that I would lay up treasure for myself in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where, for where my treasure is, and where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so, Lord, help me in this year to store up treasures on, uh, not on this earth, but store up treasures in heaven that I would, that I would, and listen, what are the treasures? I don't believe there's going to be any greater treasure. Um, outside of Christ himself, that then to come to the wedding banquet that Jesus references in Matthew 22 and to see faces of disciples that God allowed me to be a part of, to sit at the banquet table with them and celebrate Jesus and all that he has done for us. My prayer for you is that when you enter this year, that you would store up those treasures in heaven, that you would make spiritual deposits into people's lives, that you would lead them to the king, that you would point them, that you would point them into the direction away from harassment, away, away from alienation, away from helplessness, and point them to the one who loves them and wants to be the, the, the shepherd of their souls. Amen? Amen? If you are with us this morning, you are a guest, or maybe you're not a guest, you've been with us before, and you have, um, you, you have heard this, and, 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 and you, are, you, you feel like you are helpless, that you feel like you have been living in a world that just harasses you, that you are alienated, separated from Christ. In a few moments, we're going to have some uh, 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 pastors and ministers at the front come up front and just ask them, will you show me how to not be alienated from God? It is something that can take place right here, right now. Very simple. God does not make it hard for you. God meets you where you're at. So I'm going to pray. Our ministers are going to come uh, be at the front. Maybe you just want to come pray and, and dedicate, consecrate yourself to the Lord for 2016, that you, would, that you would lay up treasures in heaven instead of treasures on this earth. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for teaching us, and we thank you for, for what you're doing in our lives. We, we, we thank you that you reminded us this morning uh, that you have made us clean. Uh, we, we thank you that you, that you washed us, 
that you washed us and that we are now as white as snow. Lord, I continue to pray and ask that you would not allow us to forget, to forget our former condition. And that we would rejoice in our souls of what you've done in our lives. And that that right there, because of your love for us, that we would be compelled, as Paul says, to share your love with others. Lord, there is a battle raging in our souls. Uh, there is a battle for your name. And, and, and yes, Lord, we know in the end that every knee will bow. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Before we come to that end, Lord, we ask, we ask earnestly together as a body that you would send us out and that you would help us to be seen as the ones who are being sent out. Just as you invested in your disciples and sent them out to proclaim the gospel, help us see that that is our call as well, that you have given us all authority, that you have called us to go share the gospel with all nations, and that you are with us, that we should not fear, that you will be with us to the very end of the age. Thank you for those promises, and thank you this morning for reminding us of these things. In Christ's name.